In this video we're going to be talking about optimizing your collision geometry for both objects and worlds. We're going to be jumping around a lot here, so check the video description for uh, chapters if you want to jump around. Let's go ahead and get on into it. I'm going to go over here and hop into Smooth POV. We're inside a conference room by SOAP. I just came here as it's a good example of when you don't really need to optimize stuff, but you can if you'd like to. Um, and then I added to it two examples of objects, uh, one of which really does need optimizing. Let's first of all talk about the problem. So when you bring in a mesh into Neos, um, for example, an object such as the cat or chicken nugget, I promise it's relevant, um, or inclu in including this sort of this world that we're in here, this is all one big mesh, uh, it'll start life off with a mesh collider. And in most cases that's okay, but as the collision count of a mesh grows larger and larger, not the collision count, sorry, the polygon count of a mesh grows larger and larger, uh, it can become a problem. And this is because nearly everything that you do to an object will uh, involve collision events in some cases. For example, when I pick up this cat with my laser, that's a collision event between my laser and the cat. If I pick up the cat with my hand, that's a collision event between... Why can't I pick up the cat? There we go. Between the hand and uh, the cat. So as a polygon count of the mesh gets higher and higher, that becomes more problematic as it's harder and harder to do collision-based events with it. This is particularly the case when you have collision-based events with it that are to do with um, the character. So for example here I am in this conference room, when I jump up and down I am colliding with the mesh collider of this conference room. To take a look at why this might be a problem, let's go ahead and first of all take a look at the um, polygon count of various meshes. We're going to do this in two different ways, I'll show you the first way just once with this cat and then we'll use the second way as I prefer it. So the first way is with a developer tooltip, go ahead and inspect the object that you'd like to take a look at, use secondary here, Open Inspector, find the um, mesh renderer, grab the static mesh part here, and click to the right, and you'll get a static mesh uh, inspector here. So here you can see that this cat is 3,954 triangles. Additionally to the um, inside the orb here, you can kind of see a preview of what the cat looks like in terms of wireframe. This gives you a good idea of like how high poly is this cat. I'm not going to give um, direct in this references uh, in this video references to exactly what numbers you need to do here. It's very situational. You should look at it and um, think about what you need to do. Think about things like um, games or assets, etc., that you might be bringing in, and what the the, you know, the polygon count of those are compared to other things going on within your game. Most times in worlds of Aeneas, you'll sort of want to sort of set a polygon count limit. Hey, is this a high poly world or a low poly world? And then maybe set numbers if you're working for a team. I'll put some resources in the video description that talk about sort of polygon counts and sort of the ranges that go between there and what you might want to do there, as they'll have much more sort of better numbers and statistics about that. For the purpose of this tutorial though, this cat's fine. I mean, it could be better, but it's not that bad in terms of polys. It's uh, not moving around, it's not detailed. If we started adding a skeleton to this cat, it would probably need more polys for, for weight count, etc. The second way that we can look at the poly count of a uh, model is using this material. You can find this material inside Neos Essentials. I'll show you where it is. Let me just get to Neos Essentials and I'll turn on my private UI. So in my private UI here, you can see where I'm inside Neos Essentials. I can click Materials, and then inside Materials, I can go to this middle material here, and this is the wireframe material. So when you spawn that out, you'll see uh, exactly what I've got here in the world. So with this uh, material gun, with the material in it um, equipped, you can then go ahead and shoot things. So I'm going to go ahead and shoot the cat with it, and we can see that view that we saw inside that green ball earlier, but now it's in the cat, and we can actually sort of move around the cat and take a look. So again here you can see that cat's okay-ish. Let's go ahead and shoot the material orb at the chicken nugget, and here you can see it's just bright green. If I bring it closer, we can sometimes see, um, yeah, there we can see the tries here. And you can see this is just absolutely insane. This is a humongous amount of triangles, so it would be a great idea to optimize that mesh. Go ahead and undo that. We can also do things like take a look at the world here. So I'm going to go ahead and shoot the uh, the world that we're in, and we can see now that we've got the uh, the collision um, and not the collision geometry, but you know the, the the mesh of this world is now shown as wireframe. This mesh for this world is particularly fine. Um, I don't actually think it needs any optimization, but I can show you how to optimize it if you're interested, and we'll actually be doing that with the object in the middle here, which is the table. So if we look at the table here, again, um, it's quite good geometry. There is some detail on the um, edges here. There's a bevel, which is slightly higher poly than you might want for a collision. Uh, but again, it's fine. But I will show you how to optimize this one uh, anyway. 
it's all up to sort of your goals of the map and your experience of the map. Do make sure you're testing a map for different uh, collision-based sort of events and collision-based scenarios. I'm not quite certain I can... Oh, there we go. I've got the cat back to normal. So now let's talk about the two ways that you can go ahead and optimize things. So way number one is you can um, go ahead and replace that uh, mesh collider with a primitive collider of your choosing. So in the case of this table, which I said we're going to do, um, you can see that right now, you know, it's using this mesh as a mesh collider. But what we can actually do is approximate this table as a series of box colliders. So in this case, we can see that we've got a box along the top and then two boxes for the links. So to do that, I might go to my develop tooltip here and go to create new 3D model box. And then I can uh, position the box in the middle here and then go ahead and just rescale this box using these green guides such that it lines up with the, uh, with the table in question. So we can expand it this way, expand it this way. a little bit more here there we go i can drag it up from the ceiling i mean the floor okay all sorts of things confused today that's fine and then we can drag it out from the sides i'm not going to make this perfect um outside of a video tutorial setting i totally would but i don't want to waste your time here with that there we go that'll do so actually let's put it this way a bit included. So now we have a box, which is sort of the rough shape of the table's top. I won't do the legs, we'll just stop with the, uh, the table here. So what I might then do is go ahead and inspect this box. Turn off its uh, mesh renderer here. Make it non-grabbable, and then inspect the table. Drag the box mesh over. And then we've got that box mesh on that table. I can then go ahead and select the original mesh here with the mesh renderer and the mesh collider and delete that mesh collider. And now it's just using that box collider for that table's um, uh, collisions. I can then go ahead and recheck a uh, character collider here and then we won't be able to walk through it. But now we've dropped that down from a mesh collider to a primitive collider. So that's way number one of improving that. You can do that excessively if you'd like. You can also use any other primitive collider such as cylinders, spheres, etc. to approximate the geometry. Don't go crazy. I wouldn't normally do it with that table, but it did provide a really easy opportunity to show how you could do it for a basic object, in this case a table. You might want to go ahead and do it for the couches. Once again, I wouldn't recommend that as the couches are quite low poly as they are, but if you want to optimize everything to the max, you can go ahead and do it. For this uh, logo here, uh, it might be good to do that as a cylinder collider. For example, you could do a cylinder collider for the, um, the entire thing. That would include the middle there, but it's just up to you. Just take a look at the mesh count, uh, the poly count, and figure out if you want to do it. So that's the first way. For meshes that are a lot more complicated and you can't really approximate them with um, box colliders or any of the other primitive colliders, you have another option, and that's convex holes. So for example here, this cat could be various box colliders, but let's take a look at that other option, which is convex holes. I did want to talk about what a convex hole even is. Um, so I've got an example of one over here. You'll see these inside Essential Tools brushes, rock brushes, uh, and they allow you to play around with this, which is called a convex hole brush. And this kind of sort of shows you how they work. And these make a shape called a convex hull. And what that means is it's a uh, convex shape uh, that is defined by a series of points. Once you have these, you can kind of uh, see how they work and draw them, etc. But let's show you how they work with uh, colliders. So we're going to go ahead here and select our cat with our developer tooltip. Open up the inspector. Find the mesh collider here. And then underneath the mesh collider here, you'll see the convex hull decomposition button here. Go ahead and push that, and then hit Run Decomposition. And what this will do is it will decompose your cat's mesh, or whatever object you've got, into a series of convex holes. So in this case here, you can see that we've got a convex hole for um, the head here, this, this orange one, the, the chest and the, the legs on the front here, this green one, the middle of the body is this orange one, and then the, the yellow one on the end. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing it with this cat. I'm just showing it as an example of how to do it with a complex object. And that's because this actually appears to be more triangles in some cases than the actual underlying cat model. But it's a really good example of um, how to do it and uh, when you might want to sort of see how it works, as you can sort of see the structure of the cat underneath. Once you've done this and you're happy with it, you can go ahead and go back to this uh, 
decomposition um, dialog and you can hit remove visuals and what that will do is remove those visuals those bright colorful things and uh, you can just sort of ignore the fact that they're even there if we take a look at what's happened underneath what you'll see here is that the um, cat now has a bunch of objects parented to it each of these objects has what's called a convex hole collider attached to it with all the properties set up uh, correctly. Additionally, these convex hole um, uh, colliders will inherit properties from the mesh collider that was used to create them. So if you have a character collider on the mesh collider, it will then come down to the convex hole collider and enable um, character collider for you. Once you're done and happy, you can go ahead and remove the mesh collider component. But if you want to make changes, you can go ahead and leave that there and try again. So what you can do here is hit remove hulls. It'll remove all those uh, convex hulls for you can start again. Now the convex hull uh, decomposition dialog has so many options on it, and I'm not entirely sure what all of them do. This is another case in Neos where it comes to sort of playing around until you see fit or playing around until you understand them or what you want to get. In some cases you can just run it and it'll do a good standard defaults, but in some cases you might want to improve that. If we run decomposition again, you'll see some cases where we might have to approve it on the cat once it's done. So for example, on the cat here, both its front legs are joined together to one collider. So if I were to use this, I wouldn't be able to aim in between its legs and uh, grab something between there. You can see on the back legs there, though, those are separated. If you want to know more about the options available in the convex hull decomposition screen, you can click this question mark here, which brings up this help dialog. I know it's a lot to read, but it does explain each of the options in more detail than I could ever explain. It's all the details all about them. Um, it does get quite mathsy and quite complicated. For example, alpha controls the bias towards clipping along symmetry planes. Um, just try around playing around with those numbers. Uh, following up from this video at some point, we'll put some documentation up on the news wiki about sort of good standards. Um, the defaults are quite good though. Do just play around until you're happy and then go ahead and hit remove visuals, close the dialogue, and then come over to the cat and remove the mesh collider and you're done. That cat's now using a um, convex hull collider rather than a mesh collider. I'm going to do this on a simpler object, which is strange to say it based on what we saw earlier, which is this chicken nugget. Inspect the chicken nugget, open inspector, find that mesh collider, convex hull decomposition, run decomposition, we'll wait for that to complete. And now you'll see we've got a much more uh, suitable convex hull, which is three convex holes for the entire chicken nugget at a much lower resolution than the original mesh collider. If you remember that mesh collider, it was just bright green and couldn't really see underneath it. So again, here we have a sort of almost perfect, I would say, convex hull decomposition with the uh, the chicken nugget. You're not going to be able to get it um, all the way to just be one convex hull, and that's because it always needs to make sort of more than one, depending on the complexity of the object. If it just made one, then you'd end up with a shape that sort of looked more like these rocks, and it wouldn't be able to fit in any detail. So convex hull decomposition is all about matching detail to the needs of the model, but almost always it comes up with something that is better than the original mesh collider. In this case, it's phenomenally better. Think of that's convex hull decomposition. Last one I want to talk about, and again, it's not really required for this world, is uh, that you can also put um, box colliders or cylinder colliders or anything like that on the world for world uh, collision geometry. For example, I could replace this entire floor with a box collider. I just need to make sure that like the table collider here, I set the character collider checkbox here on that brand new box collider and then remove that mesh collider. Uh, like I said, it's not needed for this world. I just wanted to sort of use this world as an example where it might not be needed or might be needed. Um, do take a look at the uh, the polygon count whenever you're doing this and think about what you want to do. One thing of note here, which is just random at the end, not really related to collisions or walking around or picking up objects, but that's to avoid active mesh colliders. I talk about that more in my full collider series, which I'll link in the video description. With that, I think we're done. I'm going to go ahead and lead off here. If you have any other questions about convex hull decomposition, convex hull colliders, mesh colliders, anything like that, leave it in the video description or a video comment area even, and I'll get back to you. I'll speak to you soon. Goodbye.